Well, happy Valentine's Day. Uh, we are starting a brand new series on unity. What a great time to start on Valentine's Day. And it's because we want loving couples, uh, married couples, to be working together in this incredible harmony. And, and the tagline for this series is, even when we don't agree, which is extremely relevant to what's going on in all of our lives right now. So I want to give you a little test. Here, here's a good sample for unity. So here's a picture of a picture of toilet paper, which in one case, the top is where the roll comes over the top, and the other one, it comes around on the bottom. And I just want to know, have you ever had a conflict in your home about that? I had a couple that I really admired in college, and I was still a young single guy, and they were a, a spiritual couple that loved each other, and they communicated well, and I, I, I really admired them. And uh, they confessed that their very first big fight was about which way the toilet paper went on the toilet paper holder. And I, at the time, thought, how ridiculous and how silly. But you know what? Uh, I, I actually read that Ann Landers said that when she entered this into her column, it had the 15,000 letters came back of people responding, trying to show that, well, every time you see an ad, see, it comes over the top, and that's the right way to do it. And, and I guess what I'm saying is it's so easy to be disunified. <laughs> We are so able to argue about and try to prove that we're right about all kinds of things. And we may be right, but we may be destroying the unity. And so I, I believe before we can really make progress in being unified is we really need to understand what it is and how do we get there and even more importantly, why is it such a big deal? So first of all, let me give you a definition for unity. And, and I just created this as a simple definition for us to have something to talk through. Cooperating with other believers because of the importance of the gospel. So working together in an active, dynamic, loving relationship with everybody who is a true believer in Jesus Christ. Why? Because of the importance of letting the world know who Jesus is and what he's done. That this isn't just about being nice and getting along and playing in our own lane. This is really about something far more difficult and far more important about how do we work actively together with every believer who loves Jesus in a way that changes our world. And I want to say that, unfortunately, this is not the reputation of the church. That most of what the people know in the world is they see the church as judgmental and as fighting each other. And the sad truth is that we often use the great and mighty sword of the word to carve each other up. And so... This is a very important and a very difficult topic. And so I want us to clarify what we mean. So first of all, that's what unity is. Then let me tell you what it's not. Unity does not mean uniformity. So you see all these Lego characters and in your mind is saying everything is awesome. But they're all alike and they're all facing the same way and they're all doing the same thing. And this is not unity. That's called uniformity. And the only way we get to uniformity usually is by some powerful leader saying, this is how you should think, or this is what you should do, or some powerful group. And so when we hear the word unity, some of us react and think, I'm not going to be pressed into that mold. I'm not going to be losing my individuality. And some of that is so part of our culture. I think unity is particularly hard in our fiercely independent culture. In fact, we had a Japanese exchange student. Her name was Hiromi some years ago. And uh, she didn't speak a lot of English, but she was able to share a Japanese proverb that she could translate into English, and I've heard it since, and it, and it is this. The nail that sticks up gets the hammer. And, and what that meant in her culture is you want to be part of the whole group and moving together and fitting in, and that's, that's the cultural ideal of what it is supposed to be. And if you're the one that sticks up and objects, then you're going to get the hammer. And I thought, how un-American. <laughs> in fact, there's something within us that kind of judges is like, wow, that's weird. Because in our culture, to stick out and to promote yourself and to be the one who, who does things differently and, and doesn't fit in with the group, those are the heroes in our culture. And so it makes unity even more difficult because you look at that and you think, that's not American, that's not even right. And so we have this internal reaction that leads us not to working in, hu in, in unison and in harmony, but we want to be that fiercely independent person. And actually, it's made worse, I think, by our culture. I don't know if you realize how 
the algorithms of social media work together that whatever you're interested in, they feed you more of it. So here's an example. My, my wife was doing some research for a, a bed. We were looking for a new bed, and so she started checking out different kinds. And within one day, on my Facebook feed, I was getting ads related to finding uh, the right bed. And, and it's that way about who you're listening to in terms of politics and opinions. And whatever you start researching, they're going to give you more of it. And what happens in that echo chamber is that we become part of a tribe. Because people want to be fiercely independent, but they, they want to have a bunch of other people who are with them in that. And so it used to be that your, your tribe was geographical, the people in your area. And now because of the internet, and because of so much more ability to communicate, we tend to become a tribe with the people who think just like we do. And the sad part of that is that we become against people who don't. And I think there, I don't need to illustrate that. There are so many ways in which that's going on. So that's not God's picture of unity. In fact, I think the scripture clearly talks about the fact that we are not supposed to be cookie cutter. The, the picture here I have is of a clock with incredibly delicate and finely crafted pieces that all fit together. And then when the Bible talks about how we're to work together, it talks about like in the human body, there are different, there's fingers and ears and eyes and nose and feet and, and all of them have different functions. And that's how it's supposed to be, that God loves variety and diversity, but he wants it to be in harmony. And the purpose of this clock is not to showcase any one cog in the system, it's to tell the world what time it is. So all of these pieces are cooperating together for that purpose. Or for those of you who love sports, here's an illustration a little, little closer to our time frame. And that is the great Tom Brady, number 12, who has just won his seventh Super Bowl, and he's been to 10 Super Bowls. And here he is at 43. Doesn't it bother you a little bit when they're calling somebody 43 old? Maybe it bothers a few of you. But... It, it sounds almost like when you hear the commentators that Tom Brady won the Super Bowl himself. I mean, he's the v MVP. So the problem with that is, is that it took an incredible amount of people and teamwork to pull off that Super Bowl victory. He did not do it himself. In fact, there's some guy back here that is wrestling back the defender who wants to rip him to shreds. And if it weren't for his offensive line who kept him in the pocket able to throw, if it weren't for the defense that were able to shut down Patrick Mahomes, you see, all of those people had to put aside their tremendous egos, their particular agendas, maybe even their idea of what play should be called, and they had to listen to the coach, and they had to follow their leaders, and they had to work in, in harmony and unity. They had to cooperate. Why? Because they had a goal in mind. They wanted to win. So I want us to bring us back to a very important passage of Scripture. And as we look at unity, we want to anchor it in John chapter 17. And John 17 is an incredibly important prayer of Jesus. Um, I don't know exactly if he did this at one moment or if the disciples listened to all kinds of different times he prayed, but, but this is set in a setting just before the crucifixion. And Jesus is in a private conversation with the Father, and evidently the disciples are listening in, or at least John is. And we get this intimate picture of a conversation between Jesus and his Father about what he hopes will happen with his disciples, with the world, what his prayer is. In fact, this is called the high priestly prayer of Jesus, and I think it's what he is still praying. So it's a very dense and rich passage of Scripture, but also very, very important. So let's walk through this as we look at what does it mean? And we're looking here, first of all, for what is a model of unity? Where do we see unity? What's the origin of it? How does it begin? And I want to start reading in uh, John 17, verse 1. And after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to those you have given to him. Now this is eternal life 
that they might know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So Jesus is in this communication with his father, and he said, the time has come, the time that we planned before eternity began. This is the moment where the atonement for the sin of the world, for the the breaking of the power of death, for true eternal life to come. He said, this is the moment. And he's having this intimate conversation. And we're going to look more at what he says, but I, but I want you to think about who's having the conversation. That we use this picture of, of the unity, and it's a three strands that are woven together, that are braided. And that comes out of a verse in Ecclesiastes that says, one can be overpowered, but two can stand together. And a strand of three cords, or a cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And it's that picture of unity together. And I thought, what a great picture also of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And here's this conversation that says, Jesus says to the Father, you have given me these disciples. You have sent me into the world. You have given me this task. And you gave me glory so that I could give you glory. And there's this, incredible moment and we just looked at the Super Bowl and all the honor and all of the the discussion around the the winners of the Super Bowl and Jesus is saying father you gave that glory to me and now I'm going to go through this crucifixion and the resurrection and I'm going to bring that glory back to you and you have this picture of this intimate relationship between God the father and God the son and and also not in this passage but God the Holy Spirit And that the three of them, we are called to unity because they are a unity. That's how God is. That's how he wants it to be. That in fact, the word Trinity is really triunity, that the three are together in one. And then he he has this incredible picture where he says, God, we have different functions. And the Father is often looked at as the sender and the architect and the planner. And in the New Testament, or excuse me, in the Bible, all the way through the Bible, they have these differing functions that the Father is the one who sends and the one who draws. In fact, Jesus said these people, these disciples, that they were yours, Father, and now you've given them to me and I have protected them. He says in verse six, I've revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. So Jesus is saying, I have been submissive to you, Father. You chose these disciples, you gave them to me, and I have revealed your words to them. What you see is God is the planner and the sender, and then you see Jesus is the Messiah who is living in perfect submission to the Father. In fact, he makes these incredible statements like, I don't do anything except what the Father tells me. I am operating in total lockstep with the Father, not out of pressure and force, but because we are in such oneness of purpose. And so Jesus is the the Lamb of God who came to give himself as a sacrifice. And you see, in, even in the Old Testament, it's often Jesus who appears. He's called the angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. And I was having a discussion with a friend of mine, and he said, so let me ask you, when God speaks to Moses out of the burning bush, was that God the Father or was that God the Son? <laughs> and the answer is, I have no idea. Sometimes it's clear which one it is, and sometimes it's not. But often it's God the Son, who was the one who comes with the message, or comes in this case to be the perfect sacrifice. And then Jesus says, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. I want you to hear this as we talk about unity. Jesus said, Father, you sent me. You've chosen these disciples. I've revealed your words to them, and now I'm sending them. And I want them to be unified together like the same kind of unity that the Father and the Son have, which is an incredible, mind-blowing idea. And you also realize that, that he's saying, I sent them into the world, and then for them I sanctify myself, that they may truly be sanctified. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the picture of sanctification. is like washing a dirty dish and putting in a rack and making it ready for use. And obviously, when, you, when Jesus says, I sanctify myself, he's not dirty and doesn't need to be washed. But It also has a a second meaning to it, which is being dedicated to a task. Ready and dedicated, and he is preparing his heart to do the will of the Father, even to the place where he gets to the Garden of Gethsemane and says, 
not my will, but yours be done. I, in my flesh, in my humanness, I want to get out of here. I don't want to do this. But the purpose of God, the glory of God, compels me to say, not my will, but yours be done. So the foundation of them working together is not that they're exactly the same, but that they have this incredible tri-unity. And then, of course, back in a couple of chapters before this, we see that the Holy Spirit is promised, that Jesus says to his disciples, I'm going to leave, but the Spirit, the, the comforter, the helper, the advocate, there are various words that are used, but I love the word that, that helper. In fact, the deepest meaning of that is one who comes alongside. And Jesus says to the disciples, it's going to be better for you if I leave and if the Spirit comes. And I'm sure they would not have believed that at that moment. But Jesus was human. He could only be in one spot at one time. And so he said, the Spirit's going to come and he's going to indwell you. And then you, he will be able to do greater things than I've done. And so the foundation and the model for unity, the foundation for having a plan and submitting yourself to a plan that's ultimately going to save the world, it's in the Trinity itself that the reason God wants us to be so connected is not just so that the mission will work. It's because that's the very heart of God. And I want you to see that as we're talking through this because believe me, this is going to take some dying to ourselves and some work to actually learn to love and to work together with people that are different. And of course, the, the model of the Trinity is one that's going to be a foundation to all of it. But what about the second part? What are the things, here's the, here's the scripture about the Holy Spirit. It says, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said. That the Holy Spirit comes, but he's pointing back to Jesus. And Jesus is pointing to the Holy Spirit. And they're unselfishly pouring into what is God's plan. So why is it so hard? If that's true, if God's created us to, to work in harmony like he and the, in the Trinity work in harmony, then why is it so hard? And let me tell you, it's really pretty simple. Jesus in this very prayer talks about the fact that God has picked these disciples out and Jesus has been working with them. And I want you to see what he says. He says, I have given them your word, Jesus saying, I have given them the Father's word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of this world any more than I am of this world. So the foundation for unity comes in what we just talked about in Colossians, to set my mind on things above, on, on the heavenly things, instead of being caught in the flow of the earth. He says, if we're followers of Jesus, we have resigned our citizenship from the world and we have become citizens of heaven. And then he says, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. In fact, he, he says later in the prayer, while I was here, I protected them. And when we think of protection, we think he makes it nice and safe and things are going to go well and it's going to be a, a smooth path. And if you read about the disciples, that obviously was not true. What he said is, I'm going to protect them from the evil one. So what is the greatest obstacle to unity? Is that there is an enemy, that Satan is a liar and a deceiver, and he loves to bring conflict. He is an, the heart of, of Satan is arrogance and lifting himself up. And you see the whole setting. In fact, we're going to talk about this next week. The whole setting for the disciples, even when they began to believe that Jesus really was a coming king, is their response was to argue about who was going to be greatest in the kingdom. Yeah, Jesus is king and I'm going to be at his right hand. I'm going to be the number two. And even when they began to believe in Jesus, Satan could get in there and inflame it. And in fact, one of the, the sad statements is that the, the last supper of Jesus and his disciples, Jesus looks at them and he says, one of you is going to betray me. And it says specifically, and Satan entered into Judas. That there is an enemy out there that wants to destroy us. In fact, Satan's three-point plan is to steal, kill, and destroy, according to John 10. And he wants to steal our purpose and steal our unity. He wants to kill the harmony and the love and the connection we have. And he wants to destroy our witness to the world. And that's what he is working at doing. And so that's one of the reasons unity is hard, is Satan will find any little crack and he will try to make it a point of contention and argument. And this happens in our marriages. It happens in our church families. In fact, uh, I always smile a little bit when a couple comes and they're having trouble and they're saying, I think we're just incompatible. 
<laughs> and my first response, whether I say it or not, is let me introduce you to my parents. Um, they've been married oh, 66 years now, coming June, and uh, they are as different as day and night. They are so different in their personalities, and they have hammered out an incredible unity for the, all of these years, and because of that, they've been accomplished incredible things for the Lord. So incompatibility usually is Satan getting in there and using our differences to make us in, in fighting with each other and bringing in bitterness and, and discontent. And so that's the first problem. The second problem, he goes on and says, now, or in John 16, just before this, the disciples say, now we can see that you know all things and that you do not need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. And Jesus says, do you now believe? So the, the next problem is unbelief. In fact, we're listening to a, a series called Gospel Fluency, and in one of his messages, Jeff Vanderstelt says, all of us are unbelievers. Even after you come to a place where you have sufficient faith to put your trust in Jesus and to receive eternal life, there's still a whole lot of ways in which we can say with our heads and with our mouths things that we know to be true, but we are not living them out of our heart and out of our lives. And so you see this process with the disciples. I mean, think about this. They lived three years, 24-7, with the Son of God in the flesh. They watched him do incredible miracles. They watched him save their bacon a number of times. And it took them step after step after step. And they kept saying, well, you're the Messiah. Oh, well, you are. And when they finally got to hear, they said, well, you're the Son of God. And Jesus said, finally, you're believing now? And then he actually tells him, in fact, you haven't even passed the big test because you're about to be scattered and this is going to get ugly. And you're going to deny me. And you're going to run away. And so the truth is, is that our process of growth and maturity is that we have to come to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. That the gospel is really the most important story. The story of God is the only hope of the world. And that somehow my life has to line up with that in a deeper and deeper and deeper way. And that's part of why we come together on a weekend. That's part of why we study the word together so that we can come to believe the words that Jesus has revealed from the Father. So first of all, there's an enemy who would love to destroy us. And then there is our unbelief. And going back to the disciples a minute, let me, let me just point out Jesus' picture of unity. He did not pick cookie cutter people. He picked Matthew, who was a tax collector for the Roman overlords. He was cooperating with the invading army. I don't know how you'd feel about somebody taking your taxes that was giving it to some other country that had overwhelmed us. And also in his group of 12, he had Simon called Zealot. And the Zealots were a political party that believed in Jewish nationalism and patriotism and that you should rise up with the armed weapons and kill or revolt against the Roman overlords. <laughs> Can you imagine the political discussions between those guys as they're walking along the road? And then you got James and John who are called sons of thunder, not because they're light and sweet spoken. And then you got Peter who's always like, pick me, I don't know the answer, but pick me because I want the attention. And you realize Jesus chose very human, very fallible, very divided people to form into not uniformity, but to make them a team that eventually would follow Jesus to their own death. And he spent three years building their belief because the tendency is for us to say we believe, but to live in our doubts. Let me challenge you to live in your faith and visit your doubts occasionally because we're in the process of growing, but more and more believe that what God says is true. And then the third thing, the third reason why unity is so difficult is because of sin. You know what the greatest problem in our country is? Sin. You know what the greatest problem in our church is? Sin. You know what the greatest problem in your marriage is? Sin. You know why your kids are such a pain? Sin. You see, underneath it all, we are wrestling with our own flesh and with our sin nature, and it makes us want to rise up. <laughs> I love to be right, don't you? I, I love it when I can win the argument and my idea wins the day and people give me a claim and 
There are a million ways in which I want to steal God's glory. And sin enters in to our differences, to our little frictions, to our disagreements. And it turns it into times of of bitterness and pride and unforgiveness. And in the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about those things, about how God wants us to walk in humility and how forgiveness is a part of our unity. And unity is not something that happens by accident. It is hard work. And we want us to face honestly into our own responsibility for that. And let me give you a a helpful diagram. This has been helpful to me. Is that there are different ways in which we disagree. And at the core of what we need to believe is the gospel. Who God is, that the Bible is the word of God, that that the Bible tells us what is right and wrong. And in fact, the the story of God sending Jesus to deliver us from sin and death and hell and that his resurrection proves that it's true. That core of truth that we believe is worth fighting and dying for. That is why Jesus said the world will hate us because we believe that and we need to learn to believe that more and more and more intensely. It needs to go from our heads into our hearts. But then there is a next level, which is our convictions and beliefs. And those can be things about the church family, like how do we interpret the Bible? What's the place of Israel in the future? When is Jesus coming back? And, and sometimes it has to do with our convictions about how a church should operate and, and even how we should operate in our own lives. And these are things that we believe strongly and deeply. And it doesn't mean that we should just say, oh, those are no big deal. It means that we need to pray and research the scriptures and do the best we can to come to honest, deeply held convictions. But listen carefully. If people believe the gospel, but they differ in us in how church should run, then we may have discussions between them, but it's like brothers fighting, not like fighting enemies. Does that make sense? So when we are contending for the gospel, when we are saying this is worth dying for, we're saying there's a broad way and a narrow way, and only those who follow Jesus are going to heaven. When we are talking about people who also believe in Jesus, but they disagree with us on things that are very important, we need to have those discussions, but it needs to be done with a different tenor, a different spirit. And let me tell you, one of the things that's broken my heart through all of this COVID crisis is not just the discussions that have been had, but the the way they've been had. The, the sarcastic, put down, demeaning kinds of words that are being used. And the next strategy and convi- or opinions and strategies is the next level. And sometimes these are things like you ought to have communion every weekend or we don't call our speaker a pastor, we call him a preacher or this is the way you ought to do the music. And we talk about all kinds of things that are, are very important. And in fact, We may love each other and agree that we will meet in heaven, but we are going to meet in different church families. And it's it's not a bad thing that all churches aren't meeting in one big, huge building because it takes different kinds of lures to catch different kinds of fish. And so having different church families is okay as long as we realize that if you belong to the family of God, you are my brother or sister. And that we are unified around that, even if we disagree about some other things. And then, of course, it, it's not our desire to just pull in our heads and, and get into our echo chamber and just listen to people who are like us. <laughs> I read this book, it's called We've Listened to the Enemy and He's Partly Right. I think that's really good for us. Sometimes you need to listen to people who don't agree with you because when you get in the echo chamber, you get pretty arrogant and maybe you're, <laughs> I think there's gonna be a lot of apologizing in heaven, let me just say that. So there's another level and that's our preference and background and Pastor Will mentioned music styles and church programs and and some of them may have to do with schooling choices and ways that you think you ought to be involved in your community and there are so many ways to disagree. In fact, let me just say this, at my age, the older you get and the more informed you get about everything, the fewer people you agree with 100%. Maybe not even one by the time you get to 70 and 80. But here's the important thing. Can you learn to work together and cooperate for the sake of a greater purpose? And that's where we really come down to this, is what is the purpose of unity? Why is this so important? Why does Jesus make such an emphasis of it? And that'll help us. If we get the why, then we'll be able to work on the what. So let me give you the background here. Jesus says in John 17, 
I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. So he's praying to his father. He's saying, you know, this is how I brought you glory. I, I did my assignment. I obeyed. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. So the first reason why God wants us to be working in a cooperative, loving unity is because it brings glory to the Father. The only way that the church of Jesus Christ is going to make a difference in the world is if we reflect to the world something different than just one more tribe shouting one more line, being insulated from anybody who disagrees with us, especially being unkind to people who disagree. He says, Jesus said, my purpose is the glory of the Father. Why do we involve ourselves in anything we do? It should go back to, this is to bring glory to the Father. That's the ultimate reason. And then Jesus says, I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. This may surprise you, but I believe the second purpose of unity is the deep sense of joy that comes when I have dedicated myself to a cause for the king. I, I think human beings are wired to be involved in something greater than, than themselves. And, and the greatest cause of all is to be in the cause of Jesus to be giving ourselves for the gospel and, and to do that with other brothers and sisters who aren't exactly like us, but where we work together. There's a deep, rich, relational joy with that. And Jesus wanted his followers to enjoy that relationship that's a little taste of what the Trinity enjoys. And he says, I want them to be full of joy. And then lastly, he says, I in them and you in me so that they may be brought to complete unity. He says, God, here's here's my heart, is that just as you are in me and I am in you, I want them to experience that complete unity. Then the world will know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you've loved me. Now this is so important. He says, then the world will know. The message that Jesus came to give to a small band in Israel has now been commissioned to you and me. And he says, if they work together with this deep unity because of the love of the glory or because of the glory of God and because of the joy of being given themselves to this cause and so the world will know can you imagine Douglas County which can be a pretty dark and rough place can you imagine if all the believers were gone can you imagine if all the Christians just got pulled out that there are believers everywhere in school in work in our community that are that are being light to the world. And some of them agree with how I would do church and some of them disagree and some of them like the version I use and some of them don't. But I believe absolutely that the church of Jesus Christ is the hope of the world. That the reason God has put us here and left us here is so that in our loving of each other, we are gonna demonstrate the love of God and the, the truthfulness of Jesus' words that we, in fact, are supposed to be the ambassadors. We're supposed to be the, the showcase of God at work. And I don't know about you, but I feel completely unable to do that in myself. But I know that when the world sees people in church loving each other in a deep, deep way, when they see us cooperating for the importance of the gospel and putting all of our differences that are not unimportant, they're just less important, and when we set them aside and sacrifice them for the greater good, then the world is different. And can you imagine? He says, I, I'm sending them so that the world will know. And we've talked about people helping people find and follow Jesus. That, that sense of our connection with each other, of being a team, working together. And our goal is to help people find Jesus and then help them learn to follow him and to mature and to grow so that the world may know. We want to be focused on the, on the glory of God and we want to be filled with his joy and his peace and we want to be fulfilling God's plan. And if we do that, the church is an unstoppable force. The church will be making incredible changes, not just in the world, but in Douglas County and in your school, in your job. And I want to challenge you as we dismiss each of the campuses that you think about Am I bringing that unity or am I bringing disunity? Pastor Craig asked us a couple weeks ago, when I come into the room, do I bring peace or am I a, a peacemaker or a 
peace breaker. And I'd ask the same thing. When you come in, do you bring a sense of the importance of working together in love because of the greatness of what God has called us to? Or do you bring in a contrary opinion and attitude that breaks up the unity? Let's think about that together and trust that God will work a unity in us. Let me look, dismiss to the online and, and to the campus pastors.